In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Ten out of ten, a solid A. Five stars, 100%. Whatever scale we may be using, these ratings all point to the same thing, a perfect score. The parable Jesus offers in our Holy Gospel for this morning shows us also a veritable picture of perfection. There was a master of a house who planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower. Every detail is seen to and taken care of. With all things in place, the master then leased it to tenants and went into another country. This vineyard, by this description, would receive a perfect score by any earthly measure of assessment, and as time passes, the owner rightly expects a return. He has done all of the work to get it to where it is and has found some tenants to keep it all in fine working order. When the season for fruit drew near, he sent his servant to the tenants to get his fruit. The time for harvest has come. And the tenants took his servants and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants, more than the first, and they did the same to them. Just as everything seemed to have fallen completely into place, now everything is falling completely apart. The servants he has sent have been met with violence and even murder by these wicked tenants. This is done to protect their false claim that the fruit of the vineyard belongs to them. Curiously enough, more servants are sent who then meet the same treatment. Everything in this previously perfect vineyard belongs to the master who put it all in place. He is acting well within the scope of his authority when he seeks its harvest. And while he sees how the servants sent to collect him are treated, he then moves on to an even curiouser course of action. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. In watching this parable unfold, we wonder what he is thinking. The seemingly perfect vineyard he set up has been overrun by murderous thieves who refuse to, who refuse to return to him its yield, instead violently driving away all those he has sent there to collect. He thinks they will respect his son, and so he sends him in. When the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and have his inheritance. And they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. They have hijacked what was once a perfect vineyard. They've claimed it as their own, and they now sinfully defend it with bloodshed and murder. As we see the close of this parable, we do well to remember also the context in which Jesus told it. He has entered into Jerusalem and is making his way to the cross. He knows what waits for him there in the coming few days, and he knows who will eventually tell enough lies about him to get him delivered over to crucifixion. The parable itself points to the long history of God's love, care, and patience with his people Israel. Under what we know today as the Old Covenant, the believing descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had all that they needed. Their faith looked to the coming Messiah who would crush the serpent's head. Their lives were blessed by the gracious hand of God, providing for their needs and covering their sin through the sacrificial system formally set up during Moses' period of leadership. Like the vineyard in the parable, everything was set perfectly in place. But like, the parable in the, uh, but like the vineyard in the parable, it was taken over by those who cared more for themselves and who looked chiefly after their own desires. Despite the many prophets the Lord sent to rebuke Israel, pointing them back to the messianic promise, and despite the many disciplinary actions He took against them by handing them over to their enemies, the inborn desire to be like God drew them away from that which He had given them. They chased after the empty so-called gods of the nations that surrounded them, and they embraced the many sinful and vile practices found in those cultures while pursuing the desires of their own selfish interests. 
We are no different than they are, even as we now live under the new covenant. Rather than being held to the ritual and ceremonial requirements given to Israel in order to set them apart as the people from which the Messiah would come into human flesh, we continue on with the moral law as found in the Ten Commandments and their summary for us to love God and love our neighbor. As plain as God's law is, and as undeniably good as it would be if all lived by it and followed it perfectly, we also reject it, looking inward and seeking out our own means of satisfaction. In our sin, we are not willing to accept God as the only Lord of our lives. We disregard His name, using it recklessly as an interjection and curse, or not using it daily in prayer as we ought to. When we live and walk in open sin, we defame and profane His name to the world around us, rather than turning in contrition and repentance for them to see. We find other ways to fill our Sunday mornings or conjure up excuses as to why we won't make diligent use of God's Word and sacrament each week in the divine service. We challenge our earthly authorities. We embrace and even follow through on feelings of hatred and lust and jealousy and covetousness. These are the ways that we seek our own form of so-called perfection, which in fact is instead the God of our own making, the false God of temporary happiness or pleasure. And it is temporary because it is so fleeting and fast-moving, and we often engage in it as recklessly as these tenants in the vineyard as they made their murderous way toward their master's son. They foolishly thought his inheritance would be theirs and their lives would be perfect as they embraced the sin of covetousness, thievery, and murder. The sins we think will make us happy are in fact the very objects of God's just wrath, which the hearers of Jesus' parable point to when he puts this question to them. When therefore the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and let out the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the fruits in their seasons. While we may be comfortable applying these words of punishment to the Jews and religious leaders of Jesus' day who had rejected God's word and turned from his promises, we might not be so quick to apply them to ourselves today. True as it is that the Pharisees and scribes who contested Jesus' authority as we examined last week and who rejected His teachings led many astray and caused many to deny Him as the long-promised Messiah, so also do we in our sinful pursuits of what we think we want outside of God's law. The tenants in this vineyard thought all they would need to do was mistreat or murder those who were sent to collect the distant owner's harvest. They did exactly that, as Jesus tells us, even killing His Son and expecting His inheritance to go to them. This is the blindness that sin brings, preventing us from looking at our actions or our lives realistically. In our wicked embrace of sin, in our breaking God's good law, we receive no perfect rating and no good reviews. Zero out of ten, an F, zero stars, zero percent. Instead, we earned for ourselves the very treatment the crowd suggested for these wicked tenants in Jesus' parable. Of course, a miserable death is, in fact, only the start of what waits for all who hold on to their sin and refuse to turn from it. A second and eternal death awaits all unrepentant sinners and the righteous judge, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, sends them to it. This is why we need the cornerstone that he references once he brings his parable to a close. After quoting the words found in Psalm 118, verses 22 to 23, about the stone rejected by the builders becoming the cornerstone, he says, Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you, and given to a people producing its fruits. And the one who falls on this stone will be broken into pieces, and when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. 
That rejected cornerstone that Jesus references is, of course, a reference to Himself, the perfect Son of God, who in the Father's perfect plan laid down His life even for His own imperfect murderers. As our cornerstone, we who fall on Him are broken by the sorrowful contrition worked in our hearts through His perfect law and by the work of the Holy Spirit. In our broken and contrite state, we lean on the promise delivered to us personally and by name in the waters of holy baptism, trusting in that word of forgiveness and that it covers all our sin. This is a daily pattern for God's people, and turning from it will open us up to the punishment we deserve. That cornerstone and all its weight will fall on and crush those who refuse to see and turn from their sin, opting instead to chase after the lies of this world and its temporary but empty pleasures. By His grace and mercy, we as His believing people are spared that punishment because He took it first upon Himself, being pierced for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities. He came into this world just as the Master's Son entered the vineyard, and He went into death so that we would be freed from it. By His resurrection, death itself is crushed, and we as His people can now await the unfading inheritance which is kept, for heaven for us, kept in heaven for us as we watch for His return. Until that day, He uses us to point the world around us to this promise, to His perfect will as revealed in the Holy Scriptures through which He speaks in law and gospel, and to bring them here in worship, where they also can be joined to His perfect and saving work. Amen. We stand together now and confess our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. <clears throat> 